Hello and welcome back to Book and Page. We are on to the final act, Act 5, of Richard III. We are handling four scenes today, the first of which are very short little scenes, verse 3, and then the fourth scene is a little bit longer and a little bit messier. As always, we'll start with a brief summary of what happens in these scenes and then get into talking about things a little deeper. So, Scene one of Act five is poor Buckingham, who is off to his execution. He notes that it is All Souls Day, so the 1st of November, and he's sort of getting his comeuppance for backing the wrong horse. He also does remember that Margaret is in fact a prophetess. Goodbye Buckingham, we're gonna miss your head attached to your body. Scene two, we finally get Richmond entering the stage. He's landed in England and is marching on Richard in full belief that he will win because Richard doesn't have any real friends and those he does currently have will desert him very very quickly. Scene 3. Richard is making camp at Bosworth. Bosworth Fields where the final battle of his reign will take place. They're setting up some tents. One will be used for Richard's camp. The other will represent Richmond. Richard seems very, very lighthearted, even though his soldiers, for the most part, are not. And from here on out, both teams will be on the stage, in the separate camps. You'll just have to keep that in mind. On to Act 5... 4, my apologies. On to Act 4, where things get a little bit messier. Richmond heads out of his tent to take stock of his allies draw up some battle plans, and send a message to the Earl of Derby, who he's hopefully finding on his side. Richard is also running up some battle plans, and also sends word to Derby to basically say, you're on my side, right, or I'm going to kill your son. Thanks, Richard. You're a bit of a dick. But Richard heads off to sleep, and the Earl of Derby, surprise, surprise, shows up in Richmond's camp. He is here to support Richmond as much as he can, as his father-in-law, but does note that Richmond's brother-in-law, George, is in Richard's hands, and asks for him to be as careful as possible so they don't have to watch the poor kid die. Richmond understands, and also heads off to sleep. And that's when things get a little bit weird. Turns out we've got a parade of ghosts coming through as both Richard and Richmond sleep. All of the ghosts of Richard's victims show up one by one. We start with the prior Prince Edward, who we would know as Anne's previous husband before Richard, who comes in, curses Richard, and tells Richmond, go for it, you can do it, God is on your side. He is followed by, and I quote, Henry VI, Clarence, Rivers Grey and Vaug, who were all those noblemen and the Queen's brothers that Richard killed, the princes in the tower, Hastings, Lady Anne, and finally Buckingham himself. It's a little bit odd that Hastings and the princes in the tower are in the order that they are, because everybody else shows up as they've been killed, except those two, Hastings, maybe should have been in front of all of those gentlemen, but maybe he would also start blending in with all those gentlemen rather than acting as a separate one. So it works better when you can separate sort of all the gentlemen he's killed with all the people we really have sad feelings for, the little kids and Anne. And each of them basically comes in to say the exact same thing. They curse Richard to despair and die and tell Richmond to go forth protected by angels to victory. Do we end there? No. No we don't. Time for Richard to wake up. He's afraid. Terrified actually. Very, very confused. Incoherent. And a battle starting soon. He is suddenly very not sure he's going to win because he's feeling extremely guilty with this dream about these ghosts coming through of all of his dead victims. Richmond, on the other hand, wakes up full of energy from the best sleep he's ever had in his life because he drained all the dead victims of Richard showed up to tell him he would win this battle. So he's 
ready and raring to go. I, I wish, I wish I was joking about that. So we actually end the scene with Richmond giving a speech to his soldiers to fight for freedom from the tyranny of Richard. Like I said, bit of a messy scene, a little bit confusing, especially when you're reading it and not seeing it on stage where the two groups maybe are going to be a little more distinct. Let's talk about things. So why do we, in the beginning of this act, get these sort of three really short little scenes of actions happening? Well, one, we need to finish off the Buckingham storyline because we finished act four with Buckingham having been captured and act five needs to have this moment of realization with Buckingham that he's chosen wrong and he's paying the price for it. Interestingly enough, his ghost does say that I was the first to support you to win your crown and the last of your victims. So Buckingham himself turns into a prophet, as he's remembering Margaret's prophetess, and predicts that Richard's reign will end here. So it makes sense. We do also set up historically the day that this is happening, Bosworth Fields, happening after All Souls Day. And the Night of All Souls Day is also important for the, I mean, it's the elephant in the room we're going to have to address, ghosts. But we'll get there. Scene 2 and Scene 3 are, interestingly enough, trying to start setting up this pairing of Richard and Richmond that we're going to see in Scene 4 while having them separate. It's, it's, it really does help sort of acclimatize you to the fact that we're going to be comparing and contrasting these two characters on stage very shortly. So even into this moment where we do have separate scenes, where they're acting separately, we are getting a sense of how they're feeling and how their men are feeling. Richmond, of course, is coming in just like, we've got all these allies. And all of his men are also very supportive of this, recognizing that Richard's friends will flee him soon, Someone's saying, well, he doesn't actually have friends, just people who fear him. So we get a sense, not just of Richmond's feelings for this battle, but also his armies, which is very good because we then get Richard's feeling, which before all of the ghosts, he seems to be extremely lighthearted and excited. He thinks he's on the road to victory. And then we just see how absolutely depressed and like silent the people backing him are where he's just sort of like you gotta cheer up and they're just sort of like I am cheery sir my heart's ten times as cheerful as my face we're all gonna die so it's this really interesting setup that allows us to see a bit of a broader picture because scene four, as messy as it is, really does start narrowing down on Richard and Richmond through the use of the Earl of Derby and the ghosts. But those little scenes just give us this brief sense that the rest of the armies are feeling emotions based on who they're backing. Richmond, woo! Richard, um, nope. Nope, 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 nope. And what's really interesting I find in scene three where Richard is talking to some of his men is the comment about we've all got to take our knocks. So Richard himself recognizes, at least in some sense, this, this is inevitably where his actions have gotten him. And we now have to have a battle to decide who's going to rule the country. But it's a question of how personally he's taking that statement at the time he makes it. Where, where he's seeming a little cheerful, a little too cheerful maybe, a little lighthearted. Is he not taking it seriously as he himself will personally have to take some knocks? Is he just seeing it like as his army having to take some knocks to kick Richmond out? It's one of those sort of interesting little moments where he's got some clarity, but it's a question of how self-aware he actually is. 
because the Lord who responds to it is definitely like, oh yeah, no, you're gonna have to take as much as you give, sir. Which then helps lead into just this frightening moment of him reestablishing all of his allies, which then gets compared to, again, the elephant in the room, ghosts. Because Richard has this sense, again, he's does, he does have some clarity where he's like, nobody else is super happy about this. So he's asking, like, how is Northumbria? Like, how are the troops? And he keeps being reassured, like, no, they're with us. Like, they've gone into the army to tell them, good, bang up job, guys. We're gonna win this battle. Woo! For Richard III! Which we precisely don't have happen. At the end of this scene, we will see Richmond's speech to his soldiers, which you can pretty safely assume ends the scene with a bunch of men going, ha! Ah! Uh, and running off to kill some people. But we don't see that happening with Richard, because Richard really isn't properly in touch with how the soldiers are actually feeling. Like, people will lie to his face, and he's just accepting that at face value. But you know Richard is, like, a super intelligent dude. He's been able to manipulate far too many people for him to be, like, so deeply unaware of people's emotions and feelings. Which again tells us just how many cracks have shown up in Richard as like a character and as a person that he's no longer really paying attention and he's lying to himself so badly that he honestly believes like, yeah, Derby's gonna support him because I threatened his son. Like, he hasn't figured out for whatever reason that this is not going to end well for him. It literally, quite literally takes this haunted dream. So let's talk about the ghosts. What can you say? This is one of, one of those interesting points because we are talking about a history and we mentioned this with prophetic dreams prior to this point and how like maybe it's stress and maybe it's just a really good literary system that allows people to impart knowledge and understanding and move the plot forward. Because this is supposed to be the story of what actually happened. It might be a little embellished but it is meant to be the historic story. And then we get something like the ghosts who you'd expect in any Shakespearean tragedy, but not necessarily any of his histories. Ghosts are, like, infamous in Shakespearean tragedies. Hamlet, Hamlet Sr., the, the old king of Denmark, showing up as a ghost. Macbeth has ghosts, ghost daggers and ghosts and witches. So, like, this is a Shakespearean thing that has happened in his works. And then it's suddenly in a history. Which is why, again, I think with all of this, you need to be, like, spoonful of salt, dudes. Not just a few grains. Like, spoonful of salt. Because we are seeing a dramatization of this historic event. And Shakespeare is not playing these ghosts as, like, Richard's consciousness. Because Richmond comments on them as well. So these are effectively characters on the stage who speak to both men and are heard by both men. So this is when, again, we need to start letting go of the concept that we can fully understand any of these characters purely by the play. We have to recognize that Shakespeare is not writing a biography on Richard III when he's writing this play. He is writing a theatrical piece that's going to have drama involved. 
And the theater comments prior to this point should sort of be an obvious moment, but the ghosts should really set that up for a person to let go of the historic aspects and to just enjoy the theater aspects. I mean, unless you fully believe in ghosts and premonitions, and then maybe this just makes it more historical for you. But the ghost thing is a little weird, not just because it's show it, showing up in a history. I mentioned that Hastings seems to be out of order. He probably should have been before the Young Princes, if we went in order of people being killed. And then we also have the fact that none of them really say anything different from each other. And maybe they don't have to. Maybe it's because they've all suffered in the exact same way, which is Richard got power hungry and killed them. But they say the same things to Richmond too, which is like, go forth and avenge us, go forth for good angels protect you, go forth to victory. And everybody to Richard is saying despair and die. So what's happening here is not effectively moving the plot forward. It's not giving us new information. It's sort of, it's almost repetitive, right? Of these ghosts coming in and just piling up the mistakes that Richard has made, the choices Richard has made, and that will sink him. They're just attaching chain upon chain upon chain that will hold him down and defeat him. But again, in a really oddly repetitive way. So what's happening in this scene that makes it important is, is really weird because you think it would have been played up a little differently. Like ghosts should be an exciting moment or a frightening moment. But just having each ghost walk in and basically be like, despair and die, you're good man. Despair and die, you're good man. Despair and die, you're good man. Like, you see what I mean? It almost becomes mundane. It takes the fear out of it for the audience. But the thing that we have to keep in mind is how this would actually be playing out in like Richard's head. Because we haven't seen a full break in Richard just right here, go show up and then Richard's nuts. We have to actually get a sense that these ghosts, for Richard at least, would have been building up over time. Because we start seeing cracks in Richard far sooner than sort of this ghost parade coming through. So for us, it might seem really repetitive, but likely for Richard, it's been happening night after night after night. And we're just seeing the final culmination of it before the battle. And we get like a really frightened response from Richard simply because this is literally the pinnacle of his hauntings. Because we've seen him disoriented prior to this point. We've seen him not be able to make decisions, to start feeling uncomfortable about the choices he's made. So what we actually get here, that I think the repetitive nature of what the ghosts are saying is really helpful to show just how often this has probably been happening in Richard's head, where it's just been a constant buildup of these voices of the dead parading through. Because Edward's ghost has shown up before, the first Edward, because Clarence reports seeing him in his dreams. So we really, from the fact that Act One brought some of these ghosts in, I think the way this scene is supposed to play out, if we're thinking about it more in depth, is that this haunting has been building up to this point. Which is why when Richard wakes up then, he's just 
far beyond what we've seen of him prior to this point. And it's not a sudden break. Like, it's that indecision and that desperation to hold on to power that's been building that just like all the ghosts showing up at this point, it all just comes crashing down on Richard's head. Because the speech following the ghost has some really interesting parallels to his speech at the very beginning. Because I noticed that he seems to lie to himself in that beginning speech when he says like, everyone hates me because of my hunched back, so I'm going to be the villain because pretty girls won't dance with me. And then he proceeds to go on and woo Anne like it's not a problem. Because he wakes up and he says, I am the villain, nay, I lie to myself. So it's this weird sort of moment where the culmination of, of all the events of the play actually happens not even before we hit the very end of the play. We're seeing the culmination happen here in Act 5, Scene 4, where all of the ghosts come through and all of the mistakes that Richard has made come to light in this moment. But it's done in a really weird sort of dry way that should give us a sense that this has just been building up. And we're seeing it fully this one final time, but Richard's likely been seeing it far longer and has been lying to himself about seeing it. But we have to recognize again that Richmond also like acknowledges this dream that happened. So there is something different happening here. While Richard could be haunted the entire time, Richmond has now been brought into this. And even his enemies sort of recognize that he is the kingdom's best chance and their best chance at vengeance. And Richmond isn't frightened about this at all. Like he recognizes purely that they are Richard's victims who are wishing him victory. And he uses that sense to then give this rousing speech to his men, precisely encouraging them to prevent any more of these victims. He brings up their wives and he brings up these children because Richard has proven himself indiscriminate in who he attacks. And Richmond has seen that in this dream. So he actually tells his men to protect go back to their wives as conquerors, and so they're not conquered, and let their children grow up. So the ghosts have to be there in some semblance of those terms. It cannot be purely Richard's guilt that is happening inside his head, because we do have something coming from Richmond. Which is interesting because a lot of times we want to justify these things. Like, even in tragedies like Hamlet, and it's a question of who all sees the ghost. While Hamlet tries to say, yes, other people can see the ghost, Hamlet's not even the first one to see the ghost. But something like Macbeth, no one else sees the ghost. And that might be Macbeth's guilty conscience. So we're almost leaning towards the Hamlet idea where there is this afterlife for those harmed, where they can come back, because like in Hamlet, Richard is not the only one who sees these ghosts. Richmond sees them, understands them, and actually uses them as courage, and as courage for his men in heading into the battle while Richard is just absolutely destroyed. But not because of like ghostly interference, purely through words. So in that way, it doesn't really matter if the ghosts are real or not. The effect is, is the same. But we do have this weird thing with Richmond where we suddenly have to ask ourselves, are these ghosts actually here? 
And again, does it even matter? Can you have the same play when those ghosts are physical man manifestations versus manifestations of Richard's guilt? So we are almost at the end. We have one more video coming up where we're going to wrap up Act 5 and finish the play. So I'm going to keep reading and I hope you do too. See you next time.